In this episode of Outlander Ethnography, I want to explore the ethics of Claire's interaction with 18th century Highland society. Imagining the Claire Beach and Randall Fraser character as if she were a social scientist doing field research. And spoiler warning, for those of you that haven't seen Outlander, I'm going to focus on three specific examples from the first season. The exorcism of Thomas Baxter in episode three, The Way Out, Claire helping a fatally wounded man in episode four, The Gathering, and the abandonment of an infant on a fairy hill in episode 10 by the pricking of my thumbs. In each case, I'll discuss these from the perspective of a qualitative researcher, as though they were real ethnographic case studies. We'll talk about the ethical pros and cons of Claire's actions in each case, some things that she could have done better using contemporary research methods, and also some of the ways that she could salvage the scientific integrity of her research despite some pretty glaring ethical violations. In other words, what to do if you accidentally act unethically in the field. And trust me, it really can happen. Before I get started, I want to note that I'm introducing a new citation practice in my videos. From time to time, you'll see numbers appear in the upper left-hand corner of the screen. These are going to appear when I'm citing reputable scholarly publications or providing definitions of terminology. And you'll be able to find the references down in the video description. That way, if you want to adapt my video for an essay or learn more, you can scroll through the comments uh, to find exactly what you're looking for. When you hear the term scientific research ethics, you might imagine people in lab coats doing clandestine work in laboratories full of beakers and machines. Give my creation life! In the social sciences, we don't generally work in environments like laboratories, though. Uh, qualitative social scientific researchers are usually integrated into a community and work closely with their research subjects, collecting data using methods like focus groups, interviews, and participant observation. Because of that, the ethics of qualitative social science are very different from the natural sciences and medicine. Qualitative ethics manuals are full of case studies that illustrate ethical concerns in specific situations, but when it comes to general guidelines, they can be frustratingly vague. As a general rule, they advise that you avoid doing harm and protect the autonomy, well-being, and safety of your research participants. You should also be as objective as possible, avoid ethnocentrism, and avoid knowingly misrepresenting your research to others. And the gold standard that we try to apply in all cases is something called voluntary informed consent, which works very well for more controlled methods like surveys, focus groups, and so forth, but for ethnographers like our fictitious Claire Beecham, it ain't that easy. Ethnographers sacrifice control of their research environment in favor of accessing the authentic behaviors and attitudes of the people they study. And regarding informed consent, there's a real fear that explaining our research to our subjects will influence their behavior and thus corrupt the quality of our data. So ethnographic ethics look a bit different than some other qualitative methods, and it's often best to judge them on a case-by-case -case basis, assessing each cultural intervention from multiple different perspectives. Which brings us back to 18th century Scotland, where we can begin to assess the ethical dimensions of Clare's interventions in Highland communities. Now one of the first and most evident ethical aspects of Clare's engagement with the 18th century is her work as a medical practitioner and healer for the Mackenzie clan. And that begins almost immediately from the very first moment she arrives in the 18th century. When she first encounters the Mackenzies, they're in the process of setting a man's dislocated shoulder. This turns out to be Jamie. And with her medical background, Claire sees that the way that they're doing it, they're going to break Jamie's arm. She jumps in, corrects them, and sets the arm herself. And over the course of the group's trip back to Castle Leo, she continues to treat their wounds, which leads to her passively identifying later. In other words, allowing the locals to believe that she is a charmer or a healer. Be a charmer then. A beaten. Something like that. This grows into Claire becoming not only the primary medical practitioner in the Mackenzie stronghold, but into her being a relatively famous local figure due to her advanced scientific understanding of medicine. Now, this obviously involves a significant intervention in the local community. From a research perspective, Claire gains access to Caso Leo by establishing herself in a vocation that's valuable to the indigenous population and draws from a pre-existing skill set. This is easy to critique in a negative light, 
but I think that we can defend Claire here using precedence. There's an established tradition of successful and ethical ethnographers doing similar things. Uh, David Calvey, for example, worked as a bouncer, studying bouncers and their economic transactions with nightclubs in Manchester. And a lot like Claire, Laurie Graham drew from her background as a factory worker in gaining a position on the line in her research on automotive labor and manufacturing. Both of these examples draw from what people call covert participant observation, basically conducting research through community engagement without revealing aspects of your identity as a researcher. And there are other examples that we could draw from, particularly in medical anthropology, so I think that we can let this one slide, accepting that Claire's medical work would be extreme, even by the standards of covert participant observation. But the extent of Claire's engagement as a medical practitioner would involve a lot of situational risk assessment. And returning to the three examples from the introduction, the exorcism, the hunt, and the fairy child, each provides a really good example of the cost-benefit analysis that a researcher in a similar position would need to consider in order to maintain ethical standards. So let's go through each case study, the good, the bad, and the meh, and discuss them from the perspective of qualitative research ethics. Beginning with the exorcism, one day while Claire is walking in the castle gardens with the Galus character, she hears that Thomas Baxter, the young nephew of the head housekeeper, is possessed by a demon and that the village priest is planning an exorcism. Did she just say exorcism? The local belief is that the boy succumbed to possession after visiting the ruins of a nearby monastery called the Black Kirk. As Claire doesn't believe in demonic possession, she assumes that the boy must be sick in some way, and hoping that she can help, she immediately sets off to check the boy's symptoms. In town, Claire finds Thomas Baxter tied down to a bed and notes that his symptoms seem to indicate that he's been poisoned and that if she could treat him, she might be able to save his life. With that in mind, Claire asks for the exorcism to be delayed so that she can treat the boy, which brings her into direct conflict with the priest. But her request is denied by the boy's aunt and mother. In culton es mi to est. Let the father do his work. Is Deus et finem Later in the episode, on the following day, Claire tours the grounds of the Black Kirk and finds a highly poisonous plant growing there, known as Lily of the Valley, uh, inside of the ruins. Thinking that the boy might have mistaken this for a similar-looking but non-poisonous edible plant, she comes to the conclusion that Thomas Baxter was, in fact, poisoned. He can be cured, but will die unless he's given an antidote. Importantly, though, there's a risk that the antidote, a decoction of belladonna, will kill the boy if Claire's Lily of the Valley hypothesis is incorrect. But if I was wrong about the dosage or the original poison, it would cause convulsions and kill the boy almost as quickly. At this point, Claire goes back to the village, again asking for the exorcism to be delayed so that she can try to save the boy's life. This once again brings her into a direct and heated confrontation with the local priest, who is convinced that Thomas Baxter is going to die and that the exorcism is the only way to save the boy's soul. Unlike the previous day, however, this time Thomas Baxter's mother and aunt allow Claire to intervene. She administers an antidote, which is effective, and saves the boy's life. The priest then runs off in a rage, claiming that she's made a fool of God, while the family is overjoyed at what they see as a miracle. Now, approaching this from the perspective of research ethics, even though a life was saved, Claire's actions here are still problematic. Uh, to me, this is an extremely culturally invasive intervention, that not only threatens her role in the community, but also challenges local belief systems and creates an adversarial dynamic with local religious authorities. This is highly undesirable from a research perspective, even if those religious authorities are horrible, horrible people. We also have to consider the repercussions of her success. Had Claire accidentally killed the boy, she might have risked becoming a pariah or even potentially been accused of murder. In fact, the exorcism comes back to haunt her a little bit later in the season during the witch trial. Uh, due to her success, however, Claire becomes a bit of a regional celebrity. The locals see the healing of Thomas Baxter as a miracle, and Claire is a kind of miracle worker. Uh, this draws much more attention to her and her role in the community. If Claire were a qualitative researcher, this would probably corrupt the quality of her data and make it very difficult to carry out future research. People's interactions with her would constantly be influenced by a knowledge of the healing of Thomas Baxter. They would be more aware of her presence and more likely to act differently when she was around. 
And for researchers who depend on covert participant observation, which is kind of what our scientist Claire is doing, this is a huge problem. Um, but it's not necessarily a complete disaster. There's a way to salvage that kind of situation that we'll come back to in the third case study. First, though, I want to move on to our second example from episode four. Now, during the gathering of the Mackenzie clan, when the Laird's subjects come to pay homage and swear fealty, the clan organizes a boar hunt. As the clan healer, Claire is asked to come along and tend to any of the men that might be wounded. And sure enough, two men are injured during the hunt. Uh, the first has a deep laceration to one of his legs, and with Claire's background in trauma nursing, this isn't much of a problem. So you'll be all right then? Yes, but you'll have a limp. Score one for the pig. Maybe next time you'll think about going fishing. But the second man, a character named Jordy, is much more seriously injured. When Claire finds him, she notes that he has a laceration to his leg, which is severe but treatable. But she then sees a second wound to Jordy's abdomen, which is fatal. Without being able to treat his wounds or move him, Claire has no choice but to stay with Dougal Mackenzie and the dying man as they ease his pain and wait for the inevitable. Returning to a broader research perspective, uh, considering Claire's established role as the local healer, her attending the hunt and treating the wounded men is entirely defensible, and in contrast to the exorcism, as her services here are both required and requested, I would argue that her intervention in this case is necessary to maintain her role as a medical practitioner in the community. Refusing or denying to help, given her past actions and the respect that she's gained among the Mackenzies, would be highly problematic for her as a researcher and, personally, uh, potentially inviting retribution for denying aid to wounded men. The demands on her as a researcher are, at this point, more methodological than existential. What I mean by that is that Claire's success as a medical practitioner has changed the way in which the locals view her on an interpersonal level. That changes the type of information that she has access to on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, you can see in the incident with Jordy how Dougal Mackenzie's perception of Claire changes due to seeing the fact that she's familiar with physical trauma and battlefield injuries. The fact that she knows how to comfort a dying man has a transformative effect on him, thanks to Graham McTavish's excellent acting. Were Claire a researcher, one of her goals, really responsibilities at this point, would be shifting the focus of her work to assess how her success as a healer has impacted local events and how indigenous cultural attitudes shift to account for her notoriety. In this sense, to maintain an ethnographic research environment, it's sometimes beneficial to keep your research focus more open-ended than other forms of qualitative research. You want to be able to adapt to the ways in which your presence may or may not influence a community. And uh, documenting that change and integrating it into your work is one of the ways that you can do that. So, in situations like this one, where your research ethics may oblige you to intervene in local affairs, you can still maintain a flexible and self-aware methodology that's ethical, but also capable of accounting scientifically for your cultural interventions. The question of the ethics of interference versus non-interference is central to our third case study, the fairy changeling. And I think that this is an interesting one because strong ethical arguments can be made for both intervention and non-intervention. In that sense, it's a bit different from the first two case studies. One afternoon, Claire is walking in the forest, once again with her friend Galus, when she hears a baby cry out in the woods. Galus explains that they're walking past something called a fairy hill, and there's a good chance that the crying child Claire hears is not a human child, but something called a fairy changeling. What the hell are you talking about? It's the first time we encounter this, but there's a pervasive local belief that fairies sometimes steal children and leave duplicates in their place, which are called changelings. These are imagined as being identical to human children, but as being more sickly and weak. And according to local custom, if a changeling is left out on a fairy hill, there's a chance that the fairies will return and bring the human child back to the parents. Realizing that a child has been abandoned and potentially left to die, Claire acts on the same medical modus operandi that we saw with Thomas Baxter. She rejects Galus' requests to avoid interfering and hikes up the hill following the child's voice, which grows fainter and fainter with each passing minute. And unfortunately, by the time she finds the infant, it's already dead, presumably from exposure. So the question is, has scientist Claire acted ethically by interfering with local beliefs in order to potentially save an infant's life? Now, similar examples in ethnographic writing provoke polarizing responses from the research community, and you can think of these 
as drawing from two theoretical perspectives, which are sometimes termed universalist and situationist ethics. On the universalist side of things, some researchers might take a more activist approach and argue that empathy and humanistic ethics demand that Claire act, regardless of any potential repercussions. In line with this thinking, saving a human life could outweigh any other potential considerations. On the situationist side of things, which is much more common in qualitative research, others would argue that this type of intervention could potentially have severe repercussions for your research and for the community, and that it would therefore be more ethically consistent to follow local customs and document indigenous reactions to the situation rather than interfering directly. And something that the show does very well, I think, is illustrate and contrast both of these ethical considerations in the narrative. Um, for example, we initially see Claire's attempt to save the abandoned child entirely from her perspective, in which saving a life outweighs any other potential ethical or safety concerns. And we have this lingering scene with a series of jump cuts that conveys less the passage of time and more the subjective, uh, disassociating psychological effect that the infant's death has on Claire. This is contrasted with the scene in the following episode, The Devil's Mark, in which Claire is put on trial for witchcraft, and we see her attempt to save the infant's life through the eyes of the child's mother. And she brings Claire's actions forward in the trial as evidence that Claire is a witch and responsible for her child's death. In the flashback, the subjectivity of the mother's perspective is conveyed by a distorted color palette, almost as though we were in a magical realist fairy tale. And we learn about emic perceptions of the event as part of the mother's testimony. In keeping with local beliefs as the infant was sickly, the mother thought that the child had been stolen by the fairies. So she left the changeling child out on a fairy hill and stayed throughout the day waiting for the fairies and was there watching when Claire arrived and removed the child from the tree in which it had been placed. From this indigenous perspective, what Claire has done is interfere in a quasi-magical rite intended to return the healthy child back to its mother. As a consequence of that interference, however well-intentioned, the mother and many of the villagers are outraged and believe that Claire ruined the family's only chance at having their real child back. In effect, they hold Claire accountable for the death of the infant. It was her who'd done the wicked deed, sirs. I know it in my voice! And these are exactly the type of repercussions that situationist ethics of non-interference are designed to avoid. If Claire were a researcher, this would have severely damaged her ability to conduct field work effectively, and could even carry local legal ramifications that she would have to account for when she returns from the field. So, from the perspective of qualitative research, and with the benefit of hindsight, uh, the case for non-interference here is very strong. Um, and within the, the context of the show, it's actually Jamie that articulates this the best. As he's trying to comfort Claire, he says, For the parents of that child, I comfort them a bit. I think it's the changeling that died. Think of their own child, healthy and well, living forever with the fairies. It's interesting that Jamie more or less gives a functionalist reading of the belief in fairy changelings as a way of justifying non-interference, but we'll save that for another day. Uh, for the moment, I want to stress that I'm not implicitly or explicitly making a case one way or the other. As I said, while the argument for non-interference is much stronger here, both actions are defensible, just according to different ethical research paradigms. One of these prioritizes non-interference and observation, while the other allows for interference, but only insofar as the researcher's actions are well informed and capable of being accounted for reflexively. That might even involve shifting the emphasis of your work to focus on how your previous interference has shaped and influenced how locals perceive and interact with you in the field. In that sense, well-intentioned, well-informed interference, even though it might violate indigenous cultural norms, can be accommodated by ethical research boards, but only if you're capable of reframing both your research and writing to account for the effects of your actions. Still, uh, unless you're an applied anthropologist, uh, avoiding these kinds of invasive cultural interventions is an absolute necessity if you're planning to conduct qualitative research in the future. Looking back at all three case studies, in order to act ethically in her fieldwork, researcher Claire would constantly be caught in a confrontation between the professional desire to produce knowledge and the need to uphold ethically defensible values. 
And in my disciplinary opinion, she constantly veers much too far in the direction of cultural interventions. Uh, to paraphrase Hammersley and Atkinson, the main goal of ethnography should be the production of social scientific knowledge, rather than serving a practical or political cause. And a lot of people make a mistake in thinking that ethics of non-intervention in ethnography, the choice to not rush up the fairy hill, for example, stem from a cold and inhuman type of scientific detachment. This is something that Clifford Geertz, uh, for example, was absolutely adamant about rejecting in his writing. In Available Light, he argues that detachment comes not from a failure to care, but from a kind of caring resilient enough to withstand an enormous tension between moral reactions and scientific observation, a tension which only grows as moral perception deepens and scientific understanding advances. While Geertz's message here is essential to our understanding of qualitative research ethics, it's important to remember that ethnographic environments are constantly shifting, and field researchers have to make a live estimate, sometimes in real time, as to whether or not their actions are defensible. And there simply is no silver bullet that can cut through that complexity, no single ethic uh, that will be acceptable to all people in every situation. It's up to you to inform yourself, to understand your research environment, and always to consider how your actions might be perceived by other people. Now, scientist Claire often fails in that regard, but you certainly don't have to. I want to hear what you think, too. How do you see the ethics of Claire's actions? Are her cultural interventions ethically defensible? And if there are any topics you'd like me to make a video on in the future, just let me know in the comments below. And until next time, don't ever stop learning.